Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of The Lowdown. Today I'm absolutely thrilled to be joined by the author of Football Starts at Home, Tom Byer. Tom, welcome to the show. Yeah, hello Connor. I'm very happy and uh, pleased to be here with you. I've checked out some of your podcasts already. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lifelong learner. We never stop learning. So uh, every time I watch anybody um, who has some knowledge to partake, I, uh, I sit ready, even like I am today here, even though I'm supposed to be interviewed, I'm, I'm here to try to learn as much as I can. People, people kind of call me in to learn from me, but I'm secretly learning from everybody else. So I'm, I'm happy to be here. Very much appreciate that. But as we both know, learning goes two ways. But um, Tom, where to begin? I suppose growing up in the Bronx, New York, can you please take us inside your first football memory? Yeah, sure. So it actually didn't start in the Bronx, although that's where I'm from. Uh, when I was pretty young, I would say around six or seven, we moved upstate New York, rural area, about 90 miles north of New York City. And uh, football did start at home for me because my brother started playing first. And my brother started playing because our best friend's family had five boys and uh, three of them, or uh, anyone, anyway, a couple of them started playing football. So that was the connection and that was the evolution. So I was always the, the young brother chasing along, you know, uh, uh, you know with, with a ball at my feet. So that's where I started. And it was also kind of magnified by the fact that the old North American Soccer League had been in full swing with Pele, Johan Cruyff, George Best, Eusebio. I mean, these are the gods, the football gods of, of the world. Um, so that that also provided some, some inspiration as well. I remember sometimes my father would have to go up on the roof and turn the antenna. Back in those days, we just had terrestrial television, turn the antenna and yell down to us, can you see the picture? Because it was broadcast from the city and we couldn't get a, a clear signal. So that was my upbringing. Um, of playing and and then I was I was lucky too because in New York and it's it's this way way in any place in the world you know the the quality of coaching or the quality of football is going to be dependent upon you know where you live right so I was very lucky because we had a community college in upstate New York called Ulster County Community College and there was a Hungarian um, there by the name of George Visvari. And he had played at a high level. He actually played with Pushkis when, in Hungary. And then from the war, his family fled Hungary. He wound up in the US, but he built up an unbelievable football program. We call it soccer, of course, in America at the community college. And he was constantly going to the national tournament, the NJCAA, uh, which is the junior college um, Fed, uh, association. And in 1977 and 1978, they won back-to-back -back national championships and the number one draft pick for the North American Soccer League, Diego Pesha, who was originally from Yugoslavia, he was the number one draft pick. So that, that, that was a huge motivator, huge inspiration for me to just try to go to that team because that team was just flooded with immigrant players from New York City. So very rarely a local was good enough to play on that team. So I had the perfect storm, you know, it, when you when you look at countries that develop the best players, there's usually it's kind of comes down to inspiration or desperation, right? You're inspired by players who have come before you or you're desperate to try to seek a better way, a better way of life for your family. Um, so I, it was it was just I was lucky to have that. And then I wound up going to the university uh, to Ulster County Community College. Um, I had won a starting position. Uh, I played right back. Up until that time, I was always like the either the, the central midfielder or the center forward in my high school area. I was voted MVP of the year. I, the whole works. But then reality hits when I started, you know, coming together with players that were just as good or better than me. But anyway, I won a starting position, and then I um, it's it's a it's a it's a quite, quite a story actually. I'll tell you though. So after Ulster County Community College and playing the national champion uh, tournament. I got an offer to the University of Baltimore and I got a complete full scholarship. Uh, I went down there, they wined me, dined me. Um, I signed a, what was, what's called a letter of intent, which is a contract that you will attend. 
but then I went back and around the summertime or before the summertime, I realized I didn't want to go to the University of Baltimore. And this is a long story, but it, it would take too long to tell you the whole reason why. But I wanted to go, my dream was to go to play at the University of South Florida in Tampa. I'd spent some time down there when I was a young kid. I had a very good coach, a German coach named Norbert Mueller. He made a huge impact on me. And he played at that school. And we used to sneak into the university. This is like an under 12 team. We used to sneak into the university and practice at night under the lights. We weren't supposed to be there. And I just got this bug. I wanted to go there. And it was a very good program. So I took a year off and I didn't go to Baltimore. And I went over to England. And I played in the Ipswich Suffolk League, amateur league for a club named Lyston FC because I had nothing else to do. So again, long story short, I, I've come back to New York. I work summertime all summer. I sold my 10 speed bicycle and got on a bus and went down to Florida to the University of South Florida as what we call a walk on. I just walked on. I knew when the practice was, I went there and it, it's a happy ending. I won a starting position. I was voted uh, all Sun Belt Conference. I was went to the national tournament against Duke University and, and scored a goal, although we lost. So that's kind of my journey. And then I wound up over here in Japan because the entire North American Soccer League had folded. So there was no pathway for young guys my age, which was around 23 years of age at that time. So I wound up here in Japan and Kind of probably that's a good area to take a breath and uh, come up for air, but the rest has kind of been history. Of course, and obviously very fun memories to recollect growing up in upstate New York, then moving down to the University of South Florida. But obviously, you know, very far away from where you sit today, where we're speaking on this podcast in Tokyo, Japan. Indeed, Tom, I mean, what were the series of events that actually led to an American such as yourself making a move to Japan? Well, I was very fortunate. I wound up over here and I got involved in football because of my Hungarian coach at the Ulster County Community College. He was very good friends with a, a Dutchman by the name of Hans Oft. Hans Oft has legendary status here in Japan because he's the first foreigner to ever coach the Japan national team. So he had very good success here in the pre-J League. J League, we have our professional league here which started in 1993. Well, before that's what's called the JFL, the Japan Football League. That's the, that's the league that I would participate in. And so Hans Oft coached a team down in Hiroshima. Uh, all of the teams here and even today are owned by massive conglomerates, Toyota, Mazda, Hitachi, Panasonic, Yamaha, uh, and all the corporates. So Hans Oft had quite good success domestically here. So he got appointed in 1992 or three-ish, he got appointed as the first ever foreign head coach of the Japan national team. So from that, his, his assistant coach, a guy by the name of Toyoharu Takata, um, ventured over to the United States to get his coaching license, either a B or an A. And Hans Oft used to be in the US Soccer Association. He worked in the coaches education uh, department. So my Hungarian coach, my, my coach who was Hungarian, George Rosario, he was buddies with Hans Oft. So that's how the contact got. So I, I, I was basically introduced to the club Hitachi, where I was the first foreigner to ever step pit foot on the pitch there. So that was my introduction into Japanese football. I didn't, I wasn't a, 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 I didn't have a long playing career at the top level. I had a short career, but I was at Hitachi and I was the first foreigner to ever step foot on there. And at the time, the first team didn't allow foreigners to play. So although I trained with the first team every day, I played with the second team. I played all my games registered as the second team. And then I basically realized, well, this is not really going anywhere. I'm not really making much money doing it as well. So I basically hung up the boots and I wanted to stay in Japan because I fell in love with Japan. And then just that's just kind of another kind of turning point in my, my career here. And that must have been a moment where you had to show unbelievable fortitude, unbelievable resilience, because a lot of people would have packed it in. But what was the thought process like at the time? Were you going through moments of doubt? Did you come across any, anybody along the way that kind of enabled you to see out your time in Japan? Because we're looking at this now, Tom, you know, with those <laughs> rose tinted, you know, glasses in hindsight, 36 years, long time. Yeah. 
So I, Japan is a very kind of intoxifying type of place. Um, most people that come here fall in love with the place. It's, it's just got so much to offer. Um, I, again, about giving the short story, I, I grew in, in upstate New York, my dad was a police chief. So he was in law enforcement. And a lot of people don't know this story because I don't tell it that much. But my dad was the unfortunate um, attempt at an assassination attempt where um, criminals tried to literally kill my dad. And so when I was when I was 12 years old, upstate New York, we were having uh, lunch on a Sunday afternoon and all and this is a very rural area. The name of the road that we lived on is called Mountain Road. I mean, you can hear a car coming like a mile away because cars don't come up that often. And a long story short, all of a sudden, some uh, group started firing bullets at our house. So our house became riddled with bullets. My dad ran outside to exchange uh, gunfire. And basically, that was, as you can imagine, being a 12-year-old kid, that was extremely traumatizing. Um, we wound up moving down to Florida for a year to get away from everything. And then we moved back to New York. So what I'm saying is, is that that had a huge impact and influence on my life because Japan, now fast forward, is an extremely safe, protective environment, which is, you know, very, uh, I didn't realize until later on in life, the psychological kind of impact that event had. And my dad was in three shootouts. My dad was in three shootouts. And, and, and so, in, in, in America, usually, I don't know about today as much, but back in the olden days, you rarely, a policeman very rarely pulls their gun out, let alone, you know, you know pull, pull, pull the trigger. But my dad was like this super cop in New York who was in three major shootouts. So I grew up in this like very violent kind of upbringing of, you know, my dad being in the newspapers, uh, you know, just he was a very, very popular figure in my area. So I think that I kind of escaped that by coming to Japan. And that was one of the major factors of why I fell in love with this country, because this is a country where, and I've got two boys, uh, but when my boys are six and seven years old, they can walk out the door and walk to school by themselves. The kids do that regularly here. So that, that played a big, I don't usually tell this story. So this is a, an, an unusual kind of interview for me, but yes, the question, but that had a huge, huge impact on me. And so, and that's why I find myself here today after 36, 37 years. Well, it's quite remarkable insight. And you know where you sit today, Tom, obviously you've become renowned for your work and your book, Football Starts at Home. But for those who haven't already read it or in, are indeed not too familiar with yourself, could you please elaborate? Sure, Football Starts at Home is really um, a philosophy. Um, I'm after I got out of playing, I quickly got into development and I pitched an idea. I wanted to stay in Japan and I had no way to, to support myself. So I came up with this idea. Um, at the time, I couldn't speak Japanese. Now I can, obviously. And I coach in Japanese and everything I do here in Japanese football, I do in Japanese language. But at the time, I couldn't speak the language. So I wanted to try to kind of, you know, get some experience coaching. So I thought, okay, well, here in Japan, we've got lots of US military bases. We've got lots of international schools. So I focused on that group at first because I could go around and I could coach and I could do things. And um, I wound up getting with a sponsor, Nestle, uh, which basically put me on the map here and gave me some resources to go around um, and basically apply my skill. And that was, I really was focused on just trying to popularize football teach some basic skills. Back in those days, uh, you know, many people were into this kind of juggling, ball lifting, the keepy ups or whatever you want to call it, right? So I was always a great juggler. I one time juggled, uh, I, I set a video up in a park here in Tokyo by my house. And I set up a video with the old VHS videos, these huge, you know, cartridges. And I videoed myself juggling the ball 10,000 times. And it took two hours to do it. So that was kind of my shtick, so to speak. I'd go around and do some juggling. So there's a timeline for, for everything. But for me, that's what I did for, for Nestle. So I got the sponsorship of Nestle. They have a drink here called Milo, Milo, M-I-L-O. And it's like kind of a, a, it's positioned as a healthy, milky kind of Ovaltine type of drink. 
Um, so I had a sponsorship from them and I went around the country doing these events for, and I couldn't speak Japanese well. So, and this sticks, sticks with me even today. When you want to do something and you don't have the expertise to do it, you have to surround yourself with people who can do that. And that's why I've always been comfortable trying to collaborate with people. I couldn't speak Japanese that well. So I had to find someone who was bilingual that was in the football world. So I found like one of the only guys who, who sp spoke fluent English and was a player here. I brought him in, he was my, he was my communicator. Then I, I thought, okay, well, I'm not a big enough name. Why would people even show up to my events? So I thought, okay, well, I've got to find a guy who's got a big name value. So I went out and I got convinced one of my friends who was a former kind of national team star at the time to join up with me as well. So I, I, was, I was at least, you know, kind of clever enough to figure out that I needed pieces that I couldn't deliver. And that's what started in the beginning. Um, and so my background is very, very much uh, rooted in events and working with, brand, working with a sponsor, um, and it's turnkey, just setting everything up ourselves. But that would really prepare me for what I'm doing even today. So again, I'm giving the long story, but Football Starts at Home is a culmination of over 20 some odd years of experience of traveling all over Japan. There's a timeline because I also introduced the Dutchman, Will Curver, his work to Japan and created a massive organization, commercial to this day, I think it's the largest commercial football school business in the world um, that turns over on average, probably 25 million US dollars a year. I spun out of it 10 years ago, but I ran it for 15 years and I established it. So that my, my football approach is rooted in technical skill development. So that's very important to understand because that's gonna lead to why I wrote the book. So I went around, I was casted on Japan's number one television show for children presenting this one point technical lesson every weekday morning to millions and millions of children that ran for 14 years. I was highlighted in Japan's number one comic book, but everything was technique, 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 technique. So it wasn't until I had my own kids. So here's the literal genesis of football starting at home. I was doing an ev event for Adidas who I'd been with for many years as their football ambassador for close to three decades. And I was doing an event, it was a World Cup year, 2006, and I had these mini footballs and I was signing them and I was giving them away to kids at the end of the event. My events have several hundred kids in them. So while I was lit, the proverbial apple, but ball literally fell right in my lap. And while I was holding the ball, I thought small ball. And my first son, Kaito, had just started walking. So I thought, uh, wow, small ball, small. So I literally cocked my head, this is a true story. And I yelled to the Japanese guys, uh, the Adidas guys who handle me or manage my, my stuff. And I said, hey, can you send me a few of these balls to my house in Japanese? So that was it. And then a week or two later, this huge case of uh, a box of balls arrived at my house with like 20 of these little balls. So I took one or two of them at first and I, I put them in my living room. And because I'm a technical coach, I knew the importance of ball mastery. So I discouraged kicking constantly, but that's the, that's the entry point of the game. That's the natural reaction. That's the reflection of any child. You put something at their feet, they'll just kick it all the time. So I went the other direction. And again, so I, I started modeling things and I just wanted my son to do anything but kick it. I just had it in my mind, kicking, it shouldn't be the first technique you teach. So I started modeling and then the iPhones had just kind of come out, you know, cell phones, smartphones. So as just a normal father, I would video my kids and, you know, kind of keep track of it. And, but then I started to see something, started to unwind. I started to see that my son was becoming very interested in the ball. Meanwhile, he's got a stack of toys that are lined up to the ceiling that he's fallen out of love with, but he's playing with the ball. And he's always got the ball close because I'm, I'm discouraging the kicking. And then it got more deeper. I started to become a bit obsessed with challenging football development with this very simple premise. Why out of 211 FIFA member associations, that's how many countries there are, why out of 211, only eight have ever won a World Cup tournament, right? And you got South America, Uruguay, Argentina, and Brazil. 
You got Germany, Italy, Spain, France, and England. So I started studying these countries and thinking, well, maybe they've got better coaches, more coaches, better educated coaches. Maybe they've got a better national curriculum. Maybe they've got a better elite player pathway. Maybe they have better facilities. So I became obsessed with development. So I started researching it and studying it. And I basically came up with kind of D, none of the above. They had some of these things, but the common denominator was they had cultures in place that were very conducive to developing players. And what I meant, mean by that is that their culture development starts way earlier than the rest in a very unorganized, undisciplined fashion. They have balls at their feet. Younger kids will, will come in contact with a ball much earlier. But then I started to, to, and I've started reading and I've studied just about every great player in the world. I started realizing that they had some common denominators. Many of the great players, and, and even let's forward and make it relevant today, Messi, Ronaldo, Suarez, Iniesta, Neymar, Pogba, uh, Lewandowski, Cruz, Kane, all these players, two common denominators, man. They all started playing in and around the home between the ages of two and five and the roles that the fathers played, sometimes the mothers as well. So I started to see this dynamic. And while I'm seeing also this play out in my living room, and so that was the genesis for the book several years. So I didn't write the book until 2015. And I never went into this with the idea that I'm going to try to create some philosophy, some methodology, and go around and test it around the world by being invited to Ajax being invited by Dortmund, being invited by Manchester United, being invited to Dynamo Zagreb, being invited to you know the who's who of football and actually present this work. But what I did was I really stayed laser focused on figuring out this, that the best countries in the world that develop the best players in the world, they win the battle at the entry level. And what I classify the entry level is <clears throat> pre-team, uh, usually global standard when you join a team, formally organized play, crossover line into organized play, I call it, is age of six, first grade. So the entry level for me is before that. So these countries win the battle, like I say, is because before they cross over the line into organized play, they're already technically competent, they're technically confident, and there's a, a bias that manifests in an unbelievable positive way. Okay, that's first. But the rest of the world that don't have these footballing cultures that where their culture development is far more advanced starts earlier. They believe the battle is at the elite level. So they spend endless amounts of money, resources, uh, bringing in the foreign experts from Europe, you know, copying the national curriculums. And they believe that somehow they're going to catch up by focusing focus exclusively on the elite level. And the reality is they don't. They don't. So there is no real shortcut to football development. So out here in Asia, making it relevant to where I've spent you know, my whole career here, is that most countries believe they're one coach away from qualifying for World Cup. I just posted, if anybody's interested, I, I write a newsletter on my LinkedIn. I just wrote the fourth one actually yesterday about this exact topic. And so now fast forward, and you can see the data, man, it correlates. So in Japan, in, out here in Asia, AFC, where we have, I believe, 47 member association countries, it's the same serial repeat winners every time. Japan and Korea have a complete lock on East Asia. That's a, a given always. Then you've got the Saudis, you've got Iran, you've got Australia, and maybe one or two outliers. That's it, man, out of 47 countries. And it's the same ones every time. And when you look up the makeup of what they're doing, they, those other countries, they focus exclusively on the elite side. They hire the foreign technical director that comes with his briefcase full of methodologies. They, they, copy, they try to copy and import different programs from uh, uh, usually Europe. And it just, it's failed, it hasn't worked. So they're buying into failed models and they're not getting the results. But when you look at the numbers here in Asia, we have hundreds of millions, perhaps I put it in my article, 300 million Asian children under the age of six. And nobody's connected the dots to understand that it's much more about culture. And a strategy in the absence of culture gets you absolutely nowhere. It's like being on this endless treadmill to nowhere. And everybody's doing it. Oh, I, th I think it's changing. I'd like to think that we're tr trying to be agents of change. 
But the reality is, is that um, everybody's stuck on that. And I put in my article as well, since the 90, uh, since around 1993-94, no, or in the 90s, no country in AFC has qualified for a World Cup tournament without first qualifying for the under-17 and or the under-20. So if you understand that, 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 that premise, then you're investing in the wrong failed models all the time. It starts with the kids. So I say, here's my kind of elevator pitch, is that if you really want to make a difference and you really want to take that giant leap forward on a macro level, here's it, here it is, man. Develop an army of little boys and girls by the age of five and six who are skilled at ball mastery. That's the missing piece of the jigsaw puzzle. And if you can do that, most of the other problems will cease to become problems. You know, I say the problem is that most people don't know what the problem is. That becomes the problem. So the prescribing, it's like a doctor tantamount to, to prescribing the wrong medicine because he's misdiagnosed the symptoms. The symptom is better coaches, ed, ed, better education for parents. It's about engaging with the hundreds of millions or billions of, of parents here in Asia that are on the front line of development. And it's happened naturally in Europe and in South America where people haven't been able to explain it. Other than in Brazil, football's a religion, everybody plays football. But when you start really studying it and become a, a, a real student of the game, and you start picking up these little sound bites like from Neymar's dad that says, hey, people don't understand. Here in Brazil, kids don't fall in love with football, they fall in love with the ball first and foremost. Or Roy Keane, who says that skill was and never will be the result of coaching. It's a love affair between child and ball. Yeah. So it's provocative. It's not to say that coaches aren't important because they are. I have an affection for coaches because I am one. But the reality is when it comes to skill development, coaches play little impact, at least at the entry level. At the entry level, and I'll die on this hill, I say every time, the most important phase of football development is at the entry level. But the football world hasn't caught up to what science already knows. And that is, is that skill acquisition happens way earlier than they suppose it. So when you start reading these national curriculums that many developing countries have, and if you've done any of your coaching badges, you'll know that the football world divides phases of development up into different groups. So the first time a kid comes on the radar of a national body is between the ages of six and nine. They call it the discovery phase. So they build the characteristics of a six to nine year old. Uh, lacks motor skills, short attention span, clumsy. So they advocate, play fun games related to football. Now, for me, that comes from Europe. That's a very, very Eurocentric approach because we have all these old cliches, these old lines of, you know, football's the teacher, just roll the ball out, let the kids play, and somehow they're going to start playing like Ronaldo and Messi. I think what happened was, 60, 70 years ago, when coaches' education started to come about, there were three countries that were the primary drivers of coaches' education, England, Germany, and Holland. And I think what happened was is that they didn't take into consideration or the belief or assumption that there was a technical deficit outside of Europe or, or the other countries. So most of the football academia is based around systems, tactics, formation, psychology, fitness, and it didn't really, and all, I've done all my coaching badges and I see that there's very little to do with technical skill development because that was assumed. And again, I just think that football hasn't caught up to, to, to what's happening around the world. And they basically are still have these blinders on and there's this unrelentless obsession about elite player development, man. Every time you look, everywhere you look, whether it's FIFA, whether it's AFC, whether it's the federations, whether it's the professional clubs, that's all they talk about. And the reality is, is that regardless of what kind of elite structure you put in place, it's always gonna be dependent upon the quality of the players you have coming up. So we've got this mismatch in Asia in particular, where we've got all these great elite coaches that are spread all over the federations and all over the, all over the continent here. And the reality is the technical level of the players aren't good enough. So they're almost immune to this great coaching that takes place because they can't benefit from it. Because the reality is, is that all of those other schemes are the byproducts of developing really strong technical players. That's when the magic happens. That's when, you know, when you look at a country like here in Japan, I make it rele relevant, is that when I first came to Japan here in the 1980s, we had great players. We had great players on the national team. 
but we had very few of them. Today, fast forward, man, I watch a Japan national team game. And the debate is, in the olden days, we watch a national team game and we'd see that they're going to, you know, out of the best 11, there's only like a couple of really good Kimura Kazushi. I mean, there was just like some really great players. But when they came off, we we're like, oh, my goodness, they're not taking him off now. And then we just knew that the guy on the bench was not close to as good as the guy that was coming off. Now it's the opposite. And this is football. This is the way it should be. Well, well, your starting 11 is going to be different than my starting 11 or the other guy, because there's so many good players here in Japan. So what happens is when you can close the gap, the developmental gap amongst the young kids, I'm talking 8, 9, 10, 11. When you can close the gap between the very best and the least developed that's where the magic happens that's where the elite player pool becomes huge because the best players the only way to make those best players better is by increasing and making and improving the worst players i don't like to use the word worst but the least developed players they're the ones that push the best players to become better so for the audience listening if you're coaching an under 10 team under 12 team doesn't matter what age and usually what happens is, especially in America, where I'm from originally, and in, in Asia too, you'll find, let's say you got the makeup, you're even playing like, you know, eight aside with under eights or tens. Basically, there's one or two really good players who get the lion's share of the ball. And then the rest of the kids are, are below average. Well, those better kids are not being pushed to become better. They know that probably even if they miss practice during the week, the coach is probably going to start him because he wants to win. You know, it's that win at all costs, right? There's very few players. There's very few. The big question between performance and uh, and and development is, is completely different. But so therein lies the problem. And then when they see, here's the funny thing. When they see the, the super whiz kid who's at six, seven, eight, nine, everybody thinks that like lightning struck in a bottle. But no, it's because they don't understand development. And almost every time, if you know what you're looking for, that kid got the early start. It was from the father or the brother, the cousin, the uncle, the friend, whatever it is. Very rarely, this isn't a Cinderella sport where kids are just born with this, you know, this talent to be able to play football. I believe that all players possess that innate ability uh, to, to become better, uh, especially at technical skills and become talent. It's just you have to draw it out of them. You have to, you, you have to nurture it. So in the olden days, it used to be the question, the, the, the kind of, you know, intense discussion between nature versus nurture. Are you born with it or is it developed? And I think now, of course, there's certain genetics. You're not going to be able to, you know, uh, change the cer certain size of a, a you know, a tallness or shortness of a player or maybe speed. But on the nurture side, we can do a lot better. We can do a lot better on the nurture side. And so that's kind of my long kind of winded question of, you know, how did the football start at home start? So I wrote this book and uh, the best part of writing that book was, is when I finished writing the book and I wrote it with a, with a, with a, a, a proper English, um, a, a British football journalist here, Fred Varco. And he was the journalist because my English writing ability isn't as, as good as his is, that's for sure. But I, I, we did it through a series of interviews and I wrote things and, and he really captured the whole thing. But he, here's what, what was really the turning point in the book. i had been doing quite a bit of work in China at the time. I've always, I, I do a lot of work around the world, but my home base has always been Japan. I haven't left in 36, 37 years. And I got contacted by a guy by the name of Dr. John Rady, um, one of the foremost neuropsychiatrists in the world from Harvard Medical School, wrote dozen book bestseller books most remarkable and notable one is called spark and dr rady had heard about some work i did in china so he contacted me and through it was a phone call for one hour on the phone and he took a big interest in what the work was the football starts at home this whole thing of me going around talking about you know with my kids the interaction at home and blah 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 so he started to dissect what was happening i started showing him the videos of my kids in the living room at two, three, four, five, six. I started coming. I was basically telling him my philosophy in a very kind of unscientific, unacademic way. Okay, very organic. And by, because he's an academic, comes from the science medical field, he could unpack all that. So in the conversation, I let slip that, hey, by the way, I wrote a book. He said, really? And it was perked up and he said, can I read the manuscript? Because I hadn't published it yet. So we sent him the manuscript. 
And he offered to write this unbelievable part portion for the book. And it was so long that we, we thought we want to break it up into pieces. So we broke it up into the forward and the afterward of the, for the book. And that just completely took me from a different stratosphere of understanding child development and how it applies to football development. So he, if, if you want me to continue, I'll go up or I can come up with from there and you can question no, me on continue, something. Continue. About. So what happened was, is when he started to see the videos of my kids in, the, in, the, in, the, in my home, um, he started to explain what was happening. And here's what's happening. So when you're playing with a little child, infant child, or you know, one, two, three, four, five years of age, the home is considered a very safe, protective environment, away from ridicule, where kids can experiment, they can fail in a fun way. But here's now, fast forward, what I call the gift to the parents and what makes the home a magical environment. It's the parents' understanding of their child's constant need for parental attention, for parental approval, and for parental praise. And what that does is it creates a chemical electrical process in the child, which we call emotions. So when you can create an emotionally charged environment, that's where deep learning and long-term memory takes place. Every memory that's stored in the brain is attached to an emotion. So that's why the stronger the, the, stronger the emotion is, or the stronger the memory is, the stronger the emotion is going to be. That's why you, people can always remember certain situations of where they were when something happened, whether it's tragic or it was or it was glorious, because it's got it's it's basically it's it's the resid it's the residual chemical that's left in your in your body, which is emotions. That's a chemical reaction, right? So that's very conducive to learning. Now, here's another really brilliant part of the whole collaboration with Dr. Rady. The part of the brain that's responsible for ball mastery is the cerebellum. Now, the cerebellum was thought to only be responsible in the neuroscience world, was only thought to be responsible for motor skills, balance, rhythm. But the new, fast forward, functional MRIs, the technology, the cerebellum now has been discovered to be responsible for much more. What? Thinking, remembering, which is memory, okay? Decision-making, controlling emotions, reading, and single-digit mathematics. So now the neuroscience world has just completely exploded in what's happening with the cerebellum. So Dr. Rady, he covers this in the book. Now, it's kind of funny because when the book came out and I was going around the world, I had blinders on, even out of my own book. I had blinders on because I hadn't paid enough attention, <clears throat> excuse me, to what Dr. Rady had contributed to my book. <clears throat> so through all my presentations, I was more fixated because I'm dealing with coaches all the time, right? I was more fixated than just showing coaches what a, a two-year-old could do or what could a three-year-old could do or four-year-old or five-year-old or six-year-old because that's what coaches kind of are interested in, seeing that. But it wasn't until I was kind of forced into, I have a saying in my, uh, if you've seen in, and in my interviews that one of my favorite phrases is, if you're the smartest guy in the room, you're in the wrong room. So I always am seeking out the rooms. Right? And, and, and don't, I don't want this to sound kind of like too egotistical, but I was going around and doing these presentations and I'm working with grassroots coaches. So kind of feeling like I'm the smart guy in the room, right? It wasn't until I started collaborating with Dr. Rady. Then I'm, again, I'm fast forward and jumping around, but then I started, I got, um, I, I, I also caught the interest of a, a very renowned researcher from Stanford University who approached me about our work as well. And a long story short, a lot of people don't know this, but we have recently conducted research in China with five-year-olds based on our philosophy and we've collected incredible research data that came out of the Stanford Center from Peking University. In Houston, we have an entire research team that's dedicated to studying football starts at home from the University of Houston. And what these researchers are interested in is not the football component. They're interested in the cognitive, <clears throat> the emotional and the social benefits and skills that are being developed and the physical ones as well um, from this program. So what we've found now is that through ball mastery, 
what ball mastery is really teaching a child is focused attention. It's teaching a child from a very young age how to pay attention. And when you teach a child as young as two, three, four years of age how to pay attention, that's when you turn the learning switch on. So it's almost tantamount to what I call a superpower. And if learned early enough, it has ramifications for lifelong learning. And don't take it from me, this is from Dr. Rady. So what he started to correlate was is that teaching a child focused awareness, better concentration, better focus, learning how to turn the learning switch on, that spills in, into, in, over into different disciplines. What disciplines? Mathematics, reading, literacy, and a whole host of other things. So we're actually seeing this in our research now. We're taking groups, treatment groups, control groups, have our program, don't have our program, and we're showing that we're actually lifting the academic report cards or the, the scores of kids from, from these ages. So this is, this is remarkable and why I'm so kind of passionate about what we're doing because <clears throat> on a macro scale for football worldwide, this has huge ramifications, especially where you and I are working in Asia because as you know, and being in Dubai and being in the Emirates in that part of the world, most Asian families view sports and football as a distraction to education. So they limit the amount, and he, even here in Japan, we have a phenomenal, same, same thing here. Parents will control the amount of physical exercise and sports that they play because they want to, them to study because they see that as more important. So Asia, unfortunately, has not caught up with other parts of the world that understand, and Dr. Rady has, has dedicated a whole career to this. He's written a book. There's a book called Spark. I recommend it to anybody. It's, it's, most educators are familiar with Dr. Rady and Spark. So Spark is a book that was written that shows that children and people who are physically active, the impact it has on the brain. It supercharges the brain. There's a thing called BDNF. It, it creates, uh, the brain is, 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 is what we call neuroplasticity. The brain is constantly changing, constantly. As soon as you receive new information to your brain that you didn't have before, your brain biologically is connecting. And there's a saying in the neuroscience world that nerve cells that fire together, they wire together and it gets stored. So the cerebellum is basically the seat of the unconscious mind. So when you're learning those ball mastery skills and your rep, the repetition is what hardwires it, okay? It hardwires it. And without the repetition, uh, it doesn't get hardwired. So without paying attention, you, so for example, I'll give you an example that's more layman like. If, if you're watching a training session, you've got a bunch of under sixes or under eights, the coach is, is giving some particular teaching something. Most kids aren't paying attention. So most kids are, you know, they're not present, right? Um, and so learning will not take place. So you, you can bring the best coach in the world to your kids under six, under eight, under 10 training session. And if they're not paying attention, learning doesn't place it, take place. So what happens is, is that when a kid doesn't pay attention, they're activating an entirely different synaptic connection where learning doesn't take place. So that's the importance of learning this focused attention, focused awareness from a very young age. Now, some kids will just get it. They'll stumble upon it. Uh, maybe they've got better parent, better parenting. Somehow that connection. When you look at these players like Messi, Ronaldo, Suarez, and Esther, Neymar, all these guys, they have an unbelievable ability to focus and pay attention. They just happen to focus that attention on football. But if they had, if it's self-chosen, that's a key word, if it's self-chosen, they could have probably been brilliant mathematicians or scientists or whatever it is. It just, so we have this image that these great players are kind of dummies, but they're not. It's just that it's, it's, they have decided what they want to focus on. So when they go to a training session, the amount of information that they can absorb from a Pep Guardiola or, or whoever the coach would be, right? I'm gonna pick the, the bet, one of the best of the best. But their ability to, to be like a sponge really comes from that ability from a very, very young age to focus. And so this to me, and I, I do a lot of consulting and presenting, I presented to a group of people from FIFA um, a couple months back. I said, here in Asia, because everybody's, everybody is, is mystified about Asia. It's the largest population. We've got 
you know, billions of people here. We've got, you know, hundreds of millions of kids, blah, blah, blah. Where are the results? And I tell them that I, I can't, as an educator, sit in a room with several hundred parents and do a presentation and convince them to put their kids in a football program based on football's great. It's number one in the world. But I, I can and I have sat in a room of 700 Chinese families or Asian families and convince them to put their kids in a football program because we're going to make your kids smarter. We're going to make them better thinkers. We're going to make them have a better memory. We're going to have them better focused and concentrated, less disciplinary problems, because this is the data that we're getting back from this. So football needs to be more innovative. We need to stop importing these old fashioned schemes for coaches and things here to Asia. And we need to start promoting and introducing more innovative, creative ways to engage. And for me again, and then I'll take my break here. It's all about the parents, man. It's all yeah. about the parents. And until we change that culture of parents that understand the importance of ball mastery and the implications it's going to have for them academically, because that's their biggest horse in the race. It's not going to be football. Then we'll see massive change in Asia. So that's my, uh, my mantra, so to speak, that I'm relentless about. It's a lot to digest. Um, a lot to take in, but very valuable information nonetheless. Um, as you just elaborated upon there at the end, Tom, though, central to this set of parents, you had a great saying before that you can hire and fire coaches, <laughs> but you can't exactly do that with parents. So with that in mind, what does perhaps good parental education look like? I think it looks like, first of all, start, here's the thing for, for me, right? And this is how I pick different organiz organizations that I want to work with. I want to work with organizations that can put me on the highest mountain peak where I can shout down to the largest masses. So it starts with the ecosystem. Football has an ecosystem, right? We've got confederations, we've got federations, we've got member associations, we have communities, we have schools, we have teachers, we have coaches, we have parents, well, all of them. So here, I'll give you an example. When I first started working before I signed a contract with the Houston Dynamo, which was a few years back, um, one of the prerequisites that I had, I remember sitting in the room with the academy director, Paul Holaher, and the president, John Walker, and I'm, I'm, I'm always ensure that I can get access to everybody in the organization because everybody in the Houston Dynamo organization needs to know about football starting at home. And I'm talking about, when I say in the organization, I'm not just talking about the guys in front office or the coaches. I'm talking about the guy who cuts the grass or cleans the toilets. So everybody that is in that organization needs to do it. So I, I received that. So I presented to them all, to all of them. So it's really a communication. It's more of a, it's more of a, a, a message than it is a big, thick curriculum. It's more about educating parents and connecting. Who can you hit your wagon to? So for example, in Houston, who we hitch our wagon to, are early learning centers, preschools, kindergartens, first and second grade class. And when I say hitch our wagon, it's not because the Houston Dynamo have these endless resources where we wanna send our coaches there constantly. No, but those organizations are the vanguards for where parents are. So it's a way for us to get access for parents. So there's many different ways of doing it. Creating content such as we've done in the Houston Dynamo. If you go to the Houston Dynamo website, the soccer starts at home content page button, number one most viewed uh, content on their entire website. And this was pre-COVID-19. So we're changing the, we're, we're, we're turning it upside down. We're approaching football development in a much different way. Of course, we'd love to have kids playing football, but at, first of all, anybody can benefit from this, from this, from, from ball mastery. When I say anybody, I'm talking about any sport, whether it's tennis, baseball, basketball, football, cricket, whatever it is, because we're in feet. Can I remember? The feet are the furthest distance from the brain. So we very rarely have any um, opportunities to develop those neural pathways, okay? So what, what ball mastery does is from a very, very young age, it's mind, body, it's thinking, it's feeling because it's both a mental and a physical task. It's, it's physical because you gotta move the child, but it's mental because they have to control the object and the object is the ball. And if you know any, and trust me, I don't profess to be an expert in, neuro, in neuroscience or anything, but I probably know a little bit more than the average Joe does, because again, I've gotten in the room with the smart guys. 
But the reality is, is that when you can incorporate thinking and feeling body movement, that supercharges learning. That's the, that's the foundation of learning. When you can learn in an emotionally charged environment with the memory, it's all connected there. So these are, this is how you connect. This is by changing the, the paradigm and trying to shift it into what is, what, for example, most parents don't know what development looks like. They don't know. They don't know if their little Johnny or Mary is even developing. And this is a frustration. And that's why you get a lot of disciplinary problems with parents, because of course, in America, kids are paying thousands of dollars a year to play. And the kid can't transfer the ball from the right foot to the left. The kid can't do a, a, a very simple wall pass. A kid not only can't beat a player, probably can't beat a cone without knocking it over. So we have this unbelievable deficit, but yet, and no disrespect from one of my favorite teams, everybody wants to play the Barcelona way or they want to play the Ajax way, they want to play this way or that way, but the reality is the kids hit a wall. And so what we do is we create programming, we create content, we create um, you know, information that starts with parents. It starts, it all starts with the parents, but everybody in the ecosystem needs to understand it. So that's just one way, but I think for, you know, we're just lucky that we have an entire research uh, team at the University of Houston. So what we're doing in Houston is we've tied up with schools. There's a charter school, very famous in America called KIPP, K-I-P-P. They are the premier charter schools that focus on underserved minority kids, okay? So we partnered with KIPP and what we did is we created programming for school. And when I say school, early learning centers, first, second grade, even up to third and fourth. So we create programming, but here's, the, here's what supercharges it. What's happening at the school is also happening at home. It's being reinforced. So we provided this tremendous feedback loop. So what's happening at home gets reinforced at school and what's happening at school get reinforced at home. Now, even one step further, we work through the physical education classes. So we train those teachers into ball math. That's all they focus on is ball mastery and some other fun games, but it's not competitive where they're fighting for balls constantly. But what we've done is, is that we have basically connected the physical education teacher to the next lead teacher, the next teacher that's gonna have those kids in the class, whether that's math, literacy, whatever it is, because we're finding that we're also seeing that we're modifying behavior. When a child has come off of a class where they're focusing on ball mastery, they tend to be sitting in the classroom more focused, better concentration, better memory, less disciplinary problems. So we're collecting all this data and we're seeing this and we're actually, the things that we thought uh, were possible are actually we're seeing and we're getting some empirical data, we're getting you know the proof of concept, all those scientific research buzzwords that are important for proving that science, that this can be replicated. So I think this is gonna be very powerful and it's gonna be important because we're, able, we're right now, we are, especially in the Houston area, there's 17 school districts. The Houston Dynamo cannot keep up with the, the demand. They cannot keep up with, they just hired someone full-time that's just looking after, that's all they do. So we know now that the educators have embraced us. And we've noticed one of the good things about COVID-19 was, is that it forced us to think differently. It forced us to go digital. It forced us to go online. And we were very fortunate because we got access to the highest levels of educators with inside the Houston Department of Education that we might not have normally gotten access to because everybody's stuck at home. So here I was being brought in in the wee hours of the morning for me, two, three o'clock in the morning to do this football starts at home presentation to try to partake my knowledge and educate people but as I said in the beginning, I was secretly learning from everybody else because I'm sitting in a room with most, almost everybody's got a PhD, multiple PhDs. And these are very, very highly educated people. So when we started collaborating and providing the football technical side together with this academic, like all-star group that we're dealing with of researchers and things, that's when the magic started to happen. And we started really connecting and understanding the role that parents play, the environment. And it's not just with football, it's education. So if you find, if you have kids normally that excel in academia, you've, you're usually gonna find a culture at home that values education. The biggest challenge that educators have is getting their students, parents to interact with them, help with homework, take an interest in it. That's the sole 
biggest challenge that a teacher has. People don't know that, but that's one of the major, major problems. And that's what happens in a lot of these underserved minority organizations. But there's lots of other benefits as well. I mean, I could talk about this forever because it's I just I love it and I never gets old and I, I feel so passionate about it. And it, it frustrates me because the people who should know better, who are in a position to really make things change, it's slow. And it's slow because, and I put this in my newsletter to a good friend of mine, I won't out him, although he probably wants me to say his name, but I haven't asked him to do it, but he used to work for UEFA and AFC. And he saw a tweet when I was talking a couple of weeks ago about, I was saying how the entry level of the sport is way more important than the elite level. And he came on to support me and he said, you're right. And he said, the reason is, is because most federations focus on the men's national team because that's what they're graded on then. That's what they're graded on. And if the men's national team isn't doing well, they're not gonna have a job for a while. So, you know, grassroots football development is long-term. So there's no real incentive for them to invest in it and invest in it. And it, and it sounds kind of dumb, but it, that's really um, a major, major stumbling block or barrier to why change doesn't happen because everybody's fixated on that national team qualifying for the big tournaments. Was to take you back to the start of your journey in Japan, Tom, you were conscious enough and you were equally humble enough to know that you needed to go on a search for pieces that you needed fitting. Yeah. What we spoke about off camera before coming on, do you think there's enough collaboration happening in football today or is it still a case of people operating in silos? I think it's siloed a lot. I think that you've got the, you've got three, three different levels, right? Actually two, you've got the competitive level. Okay. So, I, I, I classify in three groups, um, the entry level, that's where we're in, uh, the competitive level. So for people listening, the competitive level would be, yeah, you're six years old, you join a team, you've got training, you got teammates, you got competition, you got starters, you got subs. That's it, the performance, right? Then you got the elite side. That's the professionals. That's the federation with your elite programs. That's it. They, they, there's not a lot of uh, communication going on between these groups. Once you make it to the elite level, it for some reason in football, when you've become a quote in the elite space, it's automatically assumed that you know everything about the game, A to Z. You're made it, man. You're, you're working at a professional club. You know A to Z. And we know that that's just not true. And so, and then you look at the opposite side, you could find some really, really good grassroots coaches who might not even have a coaching credential but they're looked upon as kind of disdain, like, you know, like, well, they're, you know, they're, they're the rec coaches or they're not, you know, they don't know half as much as I do. And that's not to say that, you know, coaching education is extremely important. I, I, I always recommend young people or anybody to go out and get as many credentials and learn as much as you can. And plus you need it because you can't get employed in many places as well. But I think the biggest jump and disconnect is not understanding parents and the culture and that whole idea of the entry level. And so when a kid shows up to a training session at six or seven or eight, and he's already good, people have just assumed that that kid's just a natural. So, and also I think that, and I, I hate to say this because I don't want it to be taken the wrong way, but coaching at the youngest ages is a little bit, is a little bit kind of, um, I would say too much importance that we attach to it. It's a little bit overrated because I've seen, some of the greatest coaches working with the youngest ages and kids just don't develop. They don't develop. But then I've seen kids that develop really well, like my own sons, and they had volunteer parent coaches. So again, what, the, what I'm drawing here is, is that, is that for an example, so I'm sitting in my home here in Tokyo. Out this window over here, is my son's junior high school. Out this window here is my son's elementary school. You can see them from the window. That's where I live right now, right? So when my kids, so let's go through my journey. How did my kids develop? So my kids, before they crossed over the line into organized play, they were just complete technicians at the age of six. They were very comfortable with the ball, very confident with the ball. So this is the bias that manifests. They cross over the line, their coach, uh, Parent, volunteer dad, hadn't played football much, played more rugby. He was volunteering to coach the team because his daughter, seven girls on my boys team, my, first, my oldest boys team, was on the team. So he volunteered. Now in Japan, 
once you volunteer for the first, in, in Japan, we go six years of elementary, three years junior high, three years high, high school. So for six years, he had the same coach. Now, when my son crossed over the line into organized play, dropped him off at his first practice, and then I saw that the coach, he didn't know much about football. He was very organized, though, uh, academic from a university, very well organized, but the constant and the, and, the, and the content and the substance of the training was just nothing unusual. Played a lot of games and things like that. And at first I was pulling my hair out and I thought, oh my goodness, and, and I'm on national TV every day. I'm like the technical guy. Everybody knows me for introducing technical training, da, 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 da. But my kid is now a team that's got an inexperienced coach. Now that comes to my other saying is that, you know, the quality of coaching is dependent upon where you live. I mean, where you live is going to depend upon the quality of the coaching. It's a hit or a miss depending upon where you live, right? So you could live somewhere, you got a great coach or not. But here's what I saw. A couple of years later, I kind of figured it out. I connected the dots. So here's my kind of formula. The kid that crosses over the line into organized play, who's technically proficient at that age, even paired with the inexperienced parent coach, that kid develops. That kid develops. And the reason is, first of all, there's no overcoaching. Second of all, if I take my, my coaching professional hat off, take that off and put my, put my parental hat on, I'm pretty happy, man. My kid's, my kid's the most popular kid on the team because the best kids are usually the most popular kids on the team. He became the number 10, also became the captain. He's become the leader. Of course, the best kids become the leaders because when the coach wants someone to demonstrate, they're going to ask the better kids to demonstrate. So now a six-year-old is getting the opportunity at leadership of leading 20 other six-year-olds. You know how powerful that is? And it wouldn't be until I collaborated with Dr. Rady when Dr. Rady started to spell this out. He said, Tom, when a kid at the age of six has mastered a skill, let alone a, a, ball, a soccer ball, whatever it is, that self-belief, that self-empowerment, that is self-confidence, that screams out of a child. When a child can yell, mommy, daddy, look, I did it. That's power. So that's what happens with these kids. So I started noticing and then I started thinking, wow, you know what? This is actually perhaps one of the best environments my son could be in because the coach didn't overcoach him. Every time another kid got the ball, they're looking like, where's, where's the better kid? I want to give him the ball. The coach is here. So I'm not saying that's right, but that's what manifests, right? So now when you fast forward and I look and I, I've got so much, I mean, we could stay on for hours here. I haven't even gotten to showing you my presentation, which is 278 slides. I've documented it. Players, not just my kids, but other people's kids of doing, you know, putting this kind of uh, football starts at home uh, program in place and seeing the progression, seeing from, I've got videos of different families and including my kids. What happened? from one and two years of age to three to four. What could you expect a child to do at three or four? Most people don't know. Most people at FIFA or you, they don't know that. They, they have no idea. We show them that. And then we show them four or five. Then we show them, okay, their first game when they're six years old. Well, what does that look like? Or what can that look like? So then we're trying to inspire parents. I got, hey, I had Ryan Giggs invite me to Manchester United this is when I was just start, uh, starting out. Didn't even publish the book yet, I don't think. So this might have been around 2014, I'd like to think around. The book wasn't written yet. Of course, it wasn't. So Ryan Giggs, from a mutual friend, heard about this. And there was no name for it either. There was no football starts at home. Side front. He was Louis Van Gaal's assistant coach. I flew all the way to Manchester just to see him. I flew there, arrive in London, go up to Manchester, had a dinner, a mutual friend introduced us. I had a dinner with Ryan Giggs, sitting in a restaurant, Italian restaurant, and I've got my Mac book pro here. And I'm, I'm, I saw after dinner, I open it up and I'm showing him. And there was no, that was football starts at home 1.0, okay? And I'm just showing him and his son, I find out same age as my son. So the wheels are turned, I can see he's like, hey, my kid's the same age, can he do this? So I start showing him a little bit of the progression of it, but I didn't have nearly what I have today. And I didn't understand the whole neuroscience, but okay. He sat back and he asked me, I was only there for two days, two, three days. He said, what time are you leaving tomorrow? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'm leaving in the afternoon to fly back to London. Then the next day, I'm going to fly back. It was a three-day trip. So I said, okay, come to my restaurant called George's the next day at three o'clock in the afternoon. I go to, and I had no idea what to expect. I go there. I walk in. If you're ever in, in Manchester, go check out. It's a great place, restaurant, bar, not to promote it. It's called George's. Walk in. 
takes me up a staircase and I open the door and Gary Neville, Phil Neville, uh, uh, Paul Scholes, Nikki Butt, they're all there. So I'm showing, and Gary's the ringleader. That I'm sure that's no surprise. So I'm showing them the presentation. And so the reason I'm telling the story, and I don't usually tell the story too much because I, 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 I never really wanted to put this out that I'm, 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 I'm interacting with these guys. But the point was they got it. They got it very quickly and they understood it. And then later on, Rio Ferdinand, and this is a couple of years later, he had heard about the presentation as well, winds up flying all the way to China to see and meet me. And he came to a conference that we invited him to. And he arrived. And before even going to sleep, we went down into a room. And this is at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. And I showed him the Football Starts at Home presentation. And I remember like it was yesterday, this is exactly as, what his expression was. He folded his arms, sat back in his chair. And he said, is it too late for an eight-year-old because I've been doing everything wrong with my son? So the reason I'm saying these stories is, is that these are the best of the best. These are guys that captain teams in World Cup tournaments, in Champion League finals. And I could go on and on and list the different other interactions I've had, whether it's with Romeo Jozak, who's one of the forward thinking brains of football development for the Croatian FA and Dynamo Zagreb, who invited me to Dynamo Zagreb. I presented to them, to the Federation. They then asked me to write two pages for the Croatian national curriculum based on football starts at home. But these are important because first of all, I'm an American, which is not an easy sell going to any country in the world trying to teach something new. So I'm proud of that. But more importantly, I just got the satisfaction that the best of the best, they get it, they got it. And now these people have turned into be my big supporters. You know, I was invited to IAX as well. And from IAX, from the boardroom, the IX guys drove me the next day to the KNVB to present to them as well. So people are starting to get it. And the interesting thing, the really interesting thing, Connor, about this whole thing has been, I've been embraced more by the groups and organizations that I thought wouldn't embrace me, the IAXs, the Dynamo Zagrebs, the English FA, these groups, much, much more than the Minnows. And I got asked one time, I presented to a big group from UEFA, and uh, I think it was actually one of the Spanish guys asked me, he said, uh, after seeing the presentation, said, this is a no brainer. Like what kind of barriers could you possibly get? So I told this story and I said, well, to be honest with you, I've been much more welcome from the big guns than I have from the little ones. He says, yeah. He says, the reason is, is because the countries that win World Cup tournaments, he goes, we're innovators. We're always looking to become better. We're very comfortable with what we know, but we're always striving to become better. And there's something in that as well. So that's, uh, that's uh, I, I can't even remember what the question was that you asked me, but my long-winded answer, I hope I addressed it. Of course. But, you know, as always, listening to yourself speak, Tom, obviously it's privileged to have had you on the podcast plenty of knowledge there to digest and hopefully a lot to incorporate within not only my own sessions but I know others out there will too but finally before we come to a close for anyone who's listening that is involved in youth development what would be the one bit of advice you would have for them sure I think it's a broad question depending upon what part of development they're involved in again because my expertise or my passion and love is is at the youth level I would say this, regardless if you're coaching under sixes, under eights, under tens, which need the most help, let's be honest, right? Once you get above the age of 12, then yeah, it, it, it becomes more of the tactics, the system, creating teams, uh, attacking styles, things like that. But I'm just more the champion of ensuring that kids learn the basic building blocks. So if I'm today, fast forward, I'm an under six, under eight, under 10 coach, I'm going to ensure first and foremost that my parents understand what their role is and how they can participate in their kids' um, development. Because we, ha they, we have to ma start managing the expectations of parents um, of what is possible and what's not possible. The best scenario or atmosphere or environment for any coach is, if I'm an under six, under eight, or under 10 coach, I in, in, in inherit a, a group of 20 little kids if they were already technically proficient, they were already able, and when we say technically proficient, what I'm saying is they're able to control the ball 
under no pressure first, they're able to stop and start, turn, change direction, dribble in a line, pull back and, and turn at a 90 degree angle, transfer the ball from the right foot to the left, be able to, you know, set up games. If you're, if you're put it this way, even with my football schools here that I've run here in Japan for years, no matter what the age group is, and it's usually on U6, U8, U10, U12, every session starts with a, well, fun game to get the kids, you know, running around. Uh, ball mastery, uh, maybe a move of the day, a change of direction, then set up a set up a, a, an exercise that's going to encourage full pressure. But I always have a 1v1. There's always 1v1s one, one, one in every single session that I do. And then, and that's like putting the player under a microscope. If a kid can play well and thrive under 1v1, man, that's, 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 you're, you are so far ahead of the game. The other parts of the game, like Pep Guardiola in his book said, listen, he, they, they asked the question, well, Pep, what do you look for in a, in a player when you're trying to find a player, regardless whether they're the goalkeeper? Or the, and this is what he said. He said, regardless whether goalkeeper, defender, midfielder, can they dribble? Are they strong at 1v1? Because I can teach all the other parts of the game. That's all I look for is I look for strong. So that's what I would stress for coaches is just make sure, especially from the ages of 6 to 12, that a lot of your training session is focused towards developing technically sound players who can play small-sided games. I saw your, your um, presentation um, uh, the other day that you did with um, – and I'm getting here because I, I picked lots of notes, man – I saw your presentation that you did with Mateus. Great, brilliant, the whole Fanino thing. But the thing is, is that we got to ensure that the kids, and, and again, even with Fanino, I would go one step further, and there has to be knowledgeable parents that understand what their role is, because unless you've got some kind of technical skillability, you're not going to have fun running around playing these mini games unless you're able to control the ball. You understand how to involve your, your teammates and things like that. But for me, again, it, it really just comes down to the technical part, ensuring that that part does. And that by the time they leave you, whether it's under six, under eight, under 10, under 12, if those players are technically competent, you've done your job. And if they understand and they can, they can at least have some success in small sided games, one, we want two, two, three, 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 four, four, you've done your job. Winning is not important. You should look at it much more as you're a developer. You're not a talent identification. You're a talent developer, and everybody can contribute to developing players. Absolutely brilliant. For anyone who hasn't read the book, anyone who hasn't bought the book, Football Starts at Home, I'll link it in the show notes below. Tom, absolute privilege to have you on. No, it was, uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'm always... Uh, uh, happy to engage with uh, like-minded people, especially in different parts of the world. And uh, you're also doing a great service for, um, for many people, which is unusual because you're still a youngster, especially compared to me. Getting on, getting on.